Good evening. This is the smoking section with Steve Helfer every Wednesday at 7 p.m. And I'm very happy to have my good friend and Cambridge Citizens for Smokers' Rights colleague on tonight, Paul Neff. Paul, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for coming on the show tonight. Oh, anytime. Paul has been a frequent guest, but he's a busy man, so it's hard to get him. He's a, a man about town, as you might say. Right? <laughs> Trying to be, yeah. Good, good. Uh, uh, Paul, you... Man of the streets. Man of the streets. Paul, you, uh, you know, have done a lot of reading uh, in your life. Uh, let me just ask you, uh, have you done... Would you say it covers a lot of different subjects, or do you tend to... I mean, I'm sure it's covered a lot of different subjects, but you tend to go into uh, particular subjects more than others? Uh, let's see. I, uh, historical things. I like stuff that uh, gives me a sense of history and how things got the way they are now. Can you give me an example of such a? I mean, I know it's. Well, I, I uh, just happened to pick up a book uh, about the Bader Meinhof uh, collective, the RAF. They're also called the uh, Revolutionary uh, Army Faction. I think they're called. Yes, Revolutionary and, Army uh, Faction. Yeah. Killed a number of people. Right. And they they got themselves locked into a conceptual system that demanded that they perform these acts. That in the end, all they did was leave a bunch of dead bodies. Right. It was, uh, I don't know, what was that, in the 60s or 70s? Early 70s. Early 70s, yes. Yep. There were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of, uh, for those of the audience who um, were born too late, there were a lot of uh, radical movements uh, in the 70s that were extremely violent, like the Symbionese Liberation Army in California. Well, they were like, uh, the way, because I didn't know anyone that admired them, you know. In high school, we used to laugh at them. Oh, is that right? Uh, these were people, you know, um, some of them were the same people, some of them came along later, but like their whole thing was uh, kind of started around the same time as the hippie thing and the general feeling of rebellion that was in the air. Yes, well, and, I, and then, um, but like things like that went on in Haight Ashbury were, uh, if not spontaneous, they weren't exactly pointedly political, you know. No, there's no, but Bader Meinhof and, was. And, and what happened was, like at the very first be in, you know, in yes. January 14th, 1967, uh, among the speakers, Jerry Rubin stood out because he was delivering a um, kind of a Marxist. A Leninist. political diatribe. And it went over like a lead balloon. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, in the media, uh, you know, these people manipulated the media and the media presented them as leaders of what was going on. But wait a second, who manipulated the media? The radicals, these these radicals, like Meinhof. Uh, and Jerry Rubin and Abby Hawthorne and the Weathermen. Yeah, uh, this, they sort of put themselves uh, um, in a leading role in the youth revolution, which was largely spontaneous or local. Yes, and they and non non uh, what would the word be non um, ideological. Well, uh, non doctrinaire. Let, let Paul. Let me get a word in here. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I think we forgot to mention the um, the Japanese Red Army. What were they called? Zengakuren. In Japan, there was also a radical group. Right or left? Oh, very uh, left. Yushima yeah. was in a right. Oh, that well, he was uh, uh, Yukio, Yukio Mishima. Mishima, rather. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, and some of this sort of, it was it happened at the same time as the hippies. Or, maybe even a little before, but the thing is, the hardcore politicos place themselves in a leadership role by going to the media and playing the media. And they, yes. they knew how to manipulate the media. Right. When in fact, the average, say, uh, kid, black or white, that showed up at a demonstration was not a Maoist and probably not even a Marxist. They were probably against the Vietnam War or against racial oppression or against uh, you know the the old the old image of black people which was being replaced and that was a good thing I remember hearing some people singing a song black is beautiful free Huey Huey, uh, Huey Newton right not and, Huey Long and and like what they they weren't inspired by the little red book and things like that what yes. I liked about the Panthers I, was like a new style a new pride and that took but the revolutionary excess found itself orphaned in the early 70s and it got more and more militant now how does this relate to something that you have been reading 
well, the the Meinhof, the Bader Meinhof. You've been you've been reading uh, about them. Yeah, yeah. In in a, a book or yeah, you know, in a book that I just happened. The to history find of that. the Bader Meinhof. Yeah. Group. Yeah. Well, uh, certainly in terms of uh, feminism, uh, for those of uh, those of our viewers who uh, characterize themselves as such, the Bader Meinhof was uh, uh, there were a lot of very uh, violent women in there, right? Well, yeah, well, these them? collectives, they were like, uh, the weathermen were doing a similar thing in the U.S. You know, they had collectives where they had uh, so-called criticism sessions where they would like uh, sometimes take LSD and try to smash the imperialism, sexism, racism, and all the other isms that were deep inside the psychology of members. Uh, okay, now let me ask you, uh, does this in any way relate to our... Uh, work yes, it against anti-smokerism. It does, because uh, like another thing that happened throughout the 70s and into the 80s was that frustrated uh, leftists who never really repudiated Maoism or Marxism yes. or Trotsky, they went into uh, conventional politics right. and, and in, at, into academics. And these people who I, I you know, encountered you know, living in Cambridge occasionally. They were very, um, well, what would be the word? They're very big on politically correct speech, yes. correct ideas, right. shouting other people down, mm -hmm. uh, you know, possible ostracizing people, and they're very much into preaching with assertions rather now, than with logic. Are you, are you saying Or then, empirical evidence. Are you saying then that... Uh, the anti-smoking movement has its roots in the radicalism of the late 60s or the early 70s? Well, to the extent that like politically correct ideas have infiltrated uh, mainstream politics, in other words, they, they pay it a certain amount of respect, you know, it's, it's boundaries. And, right. And uh, to that extent, yeah, it does have an impact on the way smoking is regarded, you know, like the left wanted to politicize all aspects of life. There was no personal. And um, when smoking became politicized, which in effect is like like uh, a degree of war being initiated upon it, yes. it becomes harder to really know things about your subject because it's a, it becomes a political football. You know, I mean, I'm not saying... I'm not anti-political to the point where I believe that we shouldn't you know, follow the situation closely and vote where we have a choice and stuff right. like that. But you right. don't really learn about a subject by reading political li literature. You have to collect your em empirical evidence other ways, like well, be being there. It's like sometimes I say that people should make, uh, should follow their own reason, their own judgment, and their own experience and not listen to experts. So that's much. Right. That's so right. Much. That's right. It's like when you go see a movie, you know, uh, the way I do it is I see the movie and then after I have made my own, um, you know, observations about it, I look to see what the critics have to say. Well then, so and, for example, and, let's say we were talking about the right wing and left wing. Uh, well, of course, all of those people smoked. I mean, the Bader Meinhof. And uh, they did, and the, the Red the Army, and the Red Army, and plus the uh, the less committed, you know, not really Maoist or Marxist people that actually filled out the demonstrations. Right, but there was no like in those days. There was no anti-smoking. Right, anti there was no anti no those people. No, and and you know you 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 know, right wing smoke, left wing smoke, center ring smoke. Right. And, you know, one of my theories is that, um, that one of the reasons that our country right now is having so many problems uh, in terms of uh, politicians making deals with one another and getting things done, as they say, is because tobacco has been banished from the political process. I mean, in those days, Martin Luther King could uh, smoke a cigarette and... Uh, other people who might be very right wing or whatever they shared that it was a very bonding thing I think mm -hmm. uh, tobacco mm -hmm. and uh, I think tobacco you know when it was abolished in the White House and in the Capitol uh, I think that uh, I think that that 
the, the, the politics uh, became less uh, amiable. Yeah. So even in those days, you know, people who were really right wing and really left wing, they could smoke together. That's and right. And even if they hated each other, they could. Um, there was something bonding about it, and I think, again, going back to American Indians, mm -hmm. they always, they never had a council without tobacco. Right. Never had a council without tobacco. You know, and you know that kind of intimacy and ritual and stuff and bonding that was. A, much more of a feature of the so-called counterculture that I remember than any one uh, political theme or anything like that. It, it was about, yeah, smoking was embraced, uh, certain drugs, not heroin or coke at, at the time, like say around 1970. Right. And uh, the Indians were much respected and I think that was like, it was about that more than, and about like a search for some kind of authenticity rather than a political. Thing. I mean, did you did you wear a flower in your hair in those no. days? No, you no. didn't. No, no. Uh, the flower too. That was a real flash in the pan. Yeah. You know, like by the middle of the so-called summer of love, all, right. all the hippie dealers were packing little, the hippie. little guns. Oh, was that could right. conceal in their leather jackets? So you sound like a real student of uh, the '60s and the '70s. Uh, yeah, I try to keep up to date too. Historically, yeah. But, how, what, what were you doing during that period of time? I was a, a high school student and then a college student and then I joined the labor force in like 1972. So you must have been about 18 in 1972? Right. And you, you joined the labor, what, what did you become? I didn't join anything. You, you, so I, you joined I, the labor force? The labor force, right. You went I, to work? I mean I got jobs, yeah. And kind of looked at that in a kind of romanticized Jack London and Jack Kerouac. Oh, you, at the time you were looking at it in that way? Yeah. And I was also testing out some of these ideas that I got from the left and the hippies and elsewhere, you know. So it doesn't sound like you took many ideas from the right. Oh, that's not quite true. Uh, actually, I read a thing. There was a guy that wrote speeches for Barry Goldwater. Yeah. And he was kind of an anarcho-libertarian. And who was that person? Do you remember his name? Uh, offhand, no, I don't. But there were, he got to be pretty well known for a while. And he got to be well known because he praised the Black Panthers for their, their work in the community. Oh. He thought they were a good example of self-reliance. Well, the Symbionese Liberation Army did some work in the community. That was a, Well, that was about 10 years later, and they were... Uh, initially, the Black Panthers were pretty practical, you know, and local. And then they... I, yeah. think, I mean, they got carried away. They went over the top. And uh, the movement... And this was by the time... So well, let me ask you a question. Things. One, one, uh, you know, thing you are, you, you kind of seem to maintain this optimism about uh, smoking, and uh, you know, which is kind of contrary to mine. You seem to always want to look at the glass as being half full, whereas I tend to look at it as being half empty. Uh, why, why? Explain why you were optimistic. All about right, and that that goes it, back to my, my five hundred uh, words or less. Sure, okay. that goes back to my sixties model. In fact, you know the media, the authorities, uh, they treated these so-called leaders of what was going on in the ghettos and in Haight Ashbury and on the campuses. They took them at at, at face value as the leaders. Right. Right. But in fact, they weren't. They they didn't lead anything, and. So, you know, where authorities dealt with them and related to them, but they really didn't understand what was happening with the masses. Yes. With the workaday people. Right. And, they, you know, the media being what they are, that's like their job to put a kind of a sensational So, therefore, how does that relate to the war? Because, because the majority of people were never sold on a lot of these things, uh, you know, the Maoism and stuff, or the, the sayings of Timothy Leary. I mean, people that took LSD didn't, the majority of them didn't like turn to Timothy Leary so for you, but, any but, kind of guidance. What I'm trying to say is that uh, the anti-smoking thing is big with authorities, you know, but it's, I don't think they, the public has embraced it well, let me ask uh, you an anywhere near as much as they say, because yeah. it, if, if they had, it would be uh, smoking now would be restricted to disreputable, reputable CD. Well, why do people. why do so many homes across the country 
uh, like if I go into someone's home, my assumption is they don't want me to smoke. Uh, that's the, the presumption. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm talking about a percentage of homes in the country which forbid their visitors from smoking. Right. Now, I mean, that's, I'm talking about workaday people and other people. Uh, you know, most of the, you know, so many homes I go into, I can't smoke there. You know, right. and, uh, you know, the, if the public has not embraced this, as you say, as you maintain, then why do so many people forbid smoking in their homes? There, there's, there are certain people that are very receptive to what the government has to say yeah. about a lot of things. There are few people who are very conscious of their standing in polite society, which, you know, uh, has its own sort of political correctness or fashion. Yes. And uh, so they, uh, they're they reluctant, you, you know, and reluctant to stand against the tide. Mm -hmm. and there so you think there's just a kind of uh, peer, it's not that they've embraced anti-smoking to the extent that uh, most people like to conform, and right now there is kind of an anti-smoking ethos, and therefore uh, that is not necessarily a sign of them embracing anti-smoking isn't it? right and it's not a sign that it's going to last because the fact remains there yeah. is not a smoking type as distinguished from a non-smoking type morally yeah. intellectually physically uh you know in any way well uh, and so the, and smokers are related to non-smokers smokers uh become non-smokers, smoke, non-smokers become smokers, right. there are weekend smokers or social. Don't you think a lot of people who, uh, let's say, are under chronic stress uh, or suffer from um, anxiety or depression or, for example, have difficulty concentrating, don't you think that those people uh, find uh, benefit in tobacco more so than other kinds of people. Don't you think creative, artistic types of people tend to smoke more than? Oh, more? definitely. In fact, uh, I, that's something I would stress. It's like the creative class. You know, the workaday people, students don't conspicuously uh, adhere to the the anti-smoking credo. Well, in fact, to some degree, they conspicuously don't refute that. But right. But you were saying there is no smoking type of person. And my uh, retort, if you will, to that is, well, I mean, here we say that the creative class tends to smoke more than the non-creative class. That is a type of person. Well, yeah, but I mean, not in 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 a moral sense. Or well, in a moral sense, I yeah, that's I would probably. I mean, you can't say a, the smokers are stupid, crazy, don't take care of themselves. You can't mm -hmm. say any of that is typically true and have it hold up. Uh, during the course of a walk through Harvard Square, like right now. No, that's true. And I tell you, uh, as we mentioned at our Cambridge Citizens for Smokers Rights meeting uh, last uh, Saturday, uh, when I go to New York, uh, I'm really surprised at how many people smoke. And not only how many people who smoke, but how many people who appear to be affluent smokers. Yes. Now, in Harvard Square, yes, it's it's a constant surprise to me, but you know, Paul, I guess this is fundamental disagreement with you and me, um, and I think the type of person who smokes now under the barrage of anti-smoking, uh, let's call it information for lack of a better word, yeah. is a very unusual person. Well, don't, don't uh, assume that we have a disagreement. I think... Uh, I've always admired smokers, you know, uh, yes. because it's not taken the path of least resistance. Well, that, I mean, certainly and, and anybody like, who smokes today is bucking a very, is, very is strong bucking trend. It. Yeah, even, you, and some of them don't even seem to realize to what extent that's true. Which well, I mean, I would almost smoke. say that people who smoke today, particularly in the United States, but in other countries uh, like Australia and New Zealand, who are, you know, far ahead of us, if you want to use that term, in terms of anti-smoking uh, zealotry. Right. You know, these pe the people who smoke today, I, I think, are uh, there's something about them or about us 
that is very uh, unwilling to follow authoritarian types of uh, mm -hmm. order and therefore I think that's one of the reasons that adds to the vehemence of the anti-smoking movement because they see us as having a different kind of character. Yeah. We're not the people who are going to do what we're told. Right. And they don't like that. And that right. gets them madder. And a lot of smokers, non-smokers rather, see that, you know. My hope they so. Seem that, they see that as a, a common trait between themselves and their smoking friends. I also would add that anyone who smokes marijuana is a smoker. I mean, there's no way you can call them a non-smoker. Right. Anyone that has any kind of advice, uh, oh, vice, right? <laughs> is a smoker, yeah. Uh, a, a vice, right, that but drinks beer or that uses any right. kind of pick-me-up or antidepressant should be able to relate to the smoker. Perhaps, but, and, I, but I certainly think, for example, uh, marijuana is very in vogue right now. Um, you know, uh, or at every, in every state, at every level, uh, it is becoming more and more acceptable. So, you know, for someone to smoke marijuana these days, it's not exactly bucking any kind no, of trend. No, it isn't. No. It so, has been during my lifetime, and there are still people that are in jail for infractions back when it was a major thing. But from our, my perspective, we should embrace those people, yes. whether they like it or not. Huh. Whether uh, they want to embrace us uh, or not. They right? will, though. I, I, because okay. for the public, for intelligent people to embrace something over time, it has to prove itself again and again, empirically. Like repeated assertions aren't going to do it. You know, you more or less, you have to, it has to prove itself. So you itself. have a lot of confidence in the, um, let's say, that uh, ultimately the truth will win out. Yes, because 50 years after the Surgeon General's report, and during those 50 years, people didn't act as, as expected. And one reason, I think, is because if the death toll, the mortality rate was as catastrophic <laughs> as the yes. antis tried right. to make out, if it was right. something to be truly alarmed about, yeah. as opposed to somewhat concerned, you know, like you have a friend that's a little overweight, you wish them the best, but you don't separate from them. Right. You know? Uh, if it were like at the acute level, I just don't think an we're intelligent not a, person we're, we're, could smoke today without being extremely embarrassed and private. We're not, and we're also not, uh, you know, we're not seeing a holocaust take place before our eyes, which is of course what the anti-smoking movement is claiming. Right. Uh, now, exactly. you were up in New Hampshire and uh, you purchased a carton of cigarettes for $77, right? 71. 71? Yeah. Oh really? I thought yeah. you said seventy-seven. No, seventy-one. Because I was up there and I got them for sixty-six. Yeah. And you got them at Market Basket, and I really wanted to come back with my my last four race in New Hampshire, but I wasn't able to get to the place that had them. Oh, I was able to get them for sixty-three, Paul. Yeah, I know. And you got seventy-one. Mm -hmm. Because I really would like everyone out there to do everything they can to subvert the tax. Uh, the predatory taxes in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and in other states. So uh, I'm going to do my best when I get to New Hampshire again to buy as many cigarettes as mm -hmm. I can uh, and to bring them back to Massachusetts. And if there's anybody from the public health department listening to our program, and I hope there is, yeah. and if there's anything from the Massachusetts State Department of Revenue, uh, I think your taxes are criminal and predatory and hurting a lot of poor people. Uh, and other people as well, uh, and I'm going to do everything in my power to, to subvert them. So if you want to come and get me, I'm right here at CCTV, and I'm also at home, 3 Crawford Street. Uh, so please give me a ring on the phone, uh, or send a policeman, whatever, but I will be bringing cigarettes across the border, and I will not be paying taxes on them. And I'm always up for a debate with anybody. Yeah, you're always up for a debate, and you're always So far up. I haven't been able to get a debate with an anti. You know, well, I mean, didn't you, didn't they, you uh, have a good debate with Sam uh, Lipson? No, no. I mean, uh, it was a disagreement, but he, like, sort of ducked out. He ducked out. Uh, it seems he to me. He looked uh, tired that night. He was tired, and maybe it was a little, I don't know. Listen,